so that when we're going through it, you can get something out of it because you're not going to get out of it if you take it as a whole because it just does not flow. The title of the lesson, which is a bad title, is God Touches the World. Now this morning when I went through it, when I was kind of sane and in my mind, I would have changed that except it's already on your outline and I couldn't change it. So here we go. Christmas is coming. Man, it brings all kinds of visions to your mind. There's food on the table. There's uh, loved ones gathered around. There's all kinds of decorations and festivities. And wow, it's a good time of the year. Sometimes, and in a few cases, your mind might go back to Bethlehem and the birth of Jesus. And we don't know whether the December the 25th is the date or not. Somewhere around 350 uh, A.D. in the writings of the church fathers, which you can read about anything you want in those writings, it says that December 25th is the day. And I have a passage that I cannot find now where the church fathers, early church fathers said, the apostles taught us that December the 25th is the day. We don't know. Because like I say, you can get about anything you want. Now, if you go into a different hemisphere, Instead of December the 25th, the date of Christ's birth is noted as January the 8th. In a different location, the date is located as January the 6th. So again, I want to caution you and say we are remembering Christ's birth, but it may or may not be the date. And if it was important for that date to be, don't you think God would have given it to us in his holy word? For Peter says he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Okay. Christmas is coming, y'all. And in the ministry of Jesus, as he grew up, John the Baptist prepared the way. It had to be. Because it was prophesied. He set the stage. And it started with the birth. But then Jesus grew. And Jesus matured. So he became in favor of both God and man. And so John picks up there. And he comes and he preaches repentance. Because God's kingdom is here. It's closed. You can touch it. It's at hand. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so the stage is being set for this Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks out of the shadows. It's in King of Galilee. He performs the first miracle, at least that we know of, and that was performed in that area. He changes water into wine. And the governor doesn't know and the guests don't know. But the servants, they knew what happened. And they knew that this was not normal. This was not regular. But this Jesus, he heals the sick. They bring all kinds of diseases and all kinds of problems that people have. And he heals them. Not only that, but he raises the dead. Yeah. This guy is not normal. He is not regular. Oh, set that aside because on the other hand, he's exactly regular. He's just a man. But he's God in the flesh. And he teaches repentance and baptism for the remission of sins 
and so that you can enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is Jesus. Wow. Let's put him up on a pedestal. Let's set him up as something great. But he doesn't come like that. Jesus is very unexpected. Yeah, they expect him because of the prophets. But he didn't come looking like what they expected. He comes as a carpenter. Scott's a carpenter. He's a good carpenter. But can you imagine how good Jesus would have been? Can you imagine some of the things that he would make? And there's none of those things that we know of that are still in existence. And I'm glad they're not. Because I would have given anything to have seen something Jesus did with his physical hands. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's Jesus who's the creator. And the grains of the sand of the sea. He made it. And I can see every day the sunrise and the sunset. And I can see new babies. I can see flowers. And I can see everything he did. And he does all things well. This carpenter, Messiah, I don't need a piece of furniture. At the age of 12, he said, don't you know I must be about my father's business it's not about carpentry. That's not the father's business. It's found in Luke chapter 2 and verse 49. Mary and Joseph had come back to find him in Jerusalem. He was in the temple and he was teaching the, the uh, priest. It's his law at the age of 12. He knows what the business is of God. Why at the age of 12? Because at the age of 12, they have in the Jewish uh, heritage what we call the bar mitzvah. That's when a child is declared to be a man. It's when he is apprenticed to do what he is to do in life. And the first thing you see of Jesus when he turns 12 is not in the carpentry shop of Joseph, even though I know in my mind that's where Jesus went to be trained on this earth. But he is in the temple. He is teaching those who supposedly know because now by their religion, by their heritage, whatever you want to call it, he has been declared... To be a man. Don't you know. I must be about my father's business. And they scoffed at him. And they said is this not the carpenter's son. Do we not know his mother Mary. And do we know his brothers and his sisters. Yes we know them. He's just, just a carpenter. How can he do these kinds of things. But you see, we look back on it and we see what the scripture says and we know what the truth is. They didn't have that. We can look at all the prophecies and compare. We say they should have known. I mean, after all, John prepared the way. This is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And they didn't grasp it. They didn't get it. Mm, Nathaniel. Philip sees him. He says, he's the son of God. And he goes and grabs his brother, Nathaniel. Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, Nazareth is not thought of very well. It's a bed of thieves. Can anything good come from there? And there are several lessons in that, but one is, and it's very strong, that God can take what we consider as a human 
as nothing and he can make what he wants to out of it. And out of Nazareth comes the Son of God to save the whole world. So come and see. This has been our theme for the whole year. Let me give you something to look at. Let me let you see Jesus in this world today living through us. And when he enters Jerusalem, he enters it as a triumphant king. Now, all my childhood days, I'm still a child. <laughs> Be 79 years old next month. I'm still a child. In all my childhood, I thought about how crazy it is that this king comes riding on a donkey the colt of a donkey, one that's never been ridden before. But you see, that is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah, not Jeremiah, Zechariah. I'm still foggy. Zechariah. And it is the image of a king coming in peace. If he's coming as a triumphant battle king, a warrior, he rides a white horse. Revelation has that image. But that's not how Jesus came. He's not in battle. He doesn't need to battle. <laughs> he is king of peace. King of Jerusalem. And so he comes on a donkey. And the people exclaim, throwing palm branches down and coats down. Here's the king. And they know by the palm branches he's king of peace. That wasn't just a happenstance. But there wasn't any pomp like they expected. Oh yeah, they, they made their way for him. They spread those garments down and gave him respect. But the people expected him to put down Rome. They expected him to free them from the Roman tyranny. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And I as a Christian do not need to expect worldly things in this life. I need to expect spiritual things. Does God bless us in this world? Yes. Does he show favor to you as his child? Yes. And all of those goodies that he gives you physically, that's not what's important. That is not what's important. What's important is God in my life and eternity. So Rome was not run out of town. The Jews were still under the Roman Empire. And when Christ died, they still were under that pressure. And for many years later, they still were under that pressure. So how is it thy kingdom come? Well, I want to emphasize something here. And something that I really had not considered very in much in depth until I started preparing this lesson. And that is that the kingdom has always existed. Whoa, you say, wait a minute. That must be hearsay. Heresy. That's what I meant to say. Heresy. No, it's not. God's kingdom has always existed. It existed in heaven before he ever created the first grain of sand. Since that was the example I used earlier. And when Satan rebelled, guess what happened to Satan? 
This is my kingdom. You can't stay here, Satan. You've got to get out. And so God put Satan out of his kingdom because Satan would no longer follow God's rule. So God creates the universe. Guess who rules it? God does. And so every planet obeys the law of God as God laid it down. And he creates the earth. He guess what the earth does. You go back to Genesis. There shall be cold and heat and seed time and harvest. Is there still that? The earth is obeying the rule of God. It is in his kingdom. And Jesus is telling us when he said, here's what you pray for. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He is telling me, Charlie, you pray that the rule of God will be in the hearts of men. And I want to emphasize that because that is important for our Christianity. It is important for our faith as a as Christian. God is in control of everything and his kingdom exists and it encompasses everything. Now just hold on to your objections, okay? <laughs> just hold on to your objections. There, I'm going to fix that. My heart. And I suggest to you that it is my heart that God wants now. And I suggest to you that it is my heart that I have to give to God. Because when my heart is given to God, guess what follows? Everything else. Everything else. So the kingdom came. In a sense that you've always studied it. It came on the day of Pentecost. When God shared his rule with those people. Here is how you fall in line to be with God. In Acts chapter 2 verse 16. The Bible says this is that. Which Joel spoke of. He spoke about dreaming dreams and prophesying and all kinds of things. Don't be scared. They were asking, how is it that every man hears in his own language? We talk about speaking in tongues. It might be that we ought to talk about the hearing. Because, yeah, they spoke. And here's a, I'll use our languages now, German, a Spanish, a Chinese whatever it is and they spoke one time and each one of those heard in their own language and it was God changing hearts to see his love and to experience his love rest uh, as it verses hate I have on the outline it could be ugly, it could be evil, it could be the darkness of, the, of Satan. God changing hearts. Oh, that's what we talked about earlier. Pray that the hearts be changed. And this is why repentance is necessary. It's easy for me to tell you, repent you sinner. <laughs> I need to repent very often. But it's because my heart needs to change. And that's what we are having done to us through the death of Jesus. I see how good God's been to me. I see how good he's treating me. Oh Lord, thank you for your mercy, your forgiveness. And it changes my heart and my will to being come the heart and will of God. There is what repentance really is. We talk about a change of mind, it is. 
change of action. It is. But it's given myself over to become the heart and will of God. I ask you, in your life, how often do you have to check yourself and say, I'm not abiding by the rule of God. I ask you, how often do I have to say, Lord, help me to abide with your rule? The kingdom came. It's always been here. But it was identified. It was defined. And it was shown. Everybody in the church. Is a part of the kingdom of God. Oh guess what. Let me shed this with you. Everybody outside the church. Is in the kingdom of God. Some people just do not obey him. Some people do not reverence him. Some people do not worship him. But they still are in the kingdom because God rules every single thing. But he gives us the option of obeying him or not. And God's going to judge them. I don't have to. And you don't have to. First off, the kingdom is the area or whatever. is It's ruled by God. It's that which will submit itself to God. And I suggest to you that all of nature submits to God. The one thing that has the option of not submitting to God. Hello, it's me. It's you. You just go through all the animals, all the plants, the seasons, the sun, the moon, the stars. Everything submits to that rule. But sometimes I don't. I hope you see what the kingdom really is. The kingdom is also the church. Because we are people who have said to God, I submit to you. We are people who say, God, I want you to rule in my heart and life. I want your way to be my way. And I'll tell you something. Anytime somebody becomes a Christian, they have entered the proper kingdom of God. Anytime somebody who is a Christian and who goes away from him repents and comes back, they have come back into the kingdom of God. Anytime a faithful Christian sins and repents, they come back into the kingdom of God. And I tell you that the prayer that Jesus said for me to pray. You pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. He's talking about my heart continually. And day by day. He's talking about me continually being touched. And in full repentance. He's talking about me desiring. God I want your will to be done in my life. Is it the church? Yeah. Yeah. Kingdom is the church. Is it the universe? Yeah. Is it heaven? Yes. The question is. Whether or not I'm going to fall in line. With the rule. And will. Of God. I have the title of this lesson, God's Touch. He touches everything. You can go to Psalms 139 and you can see it. The psalmist says, just pick a place you want to go. 
Now, I don't care where it is. You're going to find God there. I'm going to expand that just a little bit. There's no place on this earth you can go where God isn't. There's no place in this universe you can go where God isn't. There's no place in the spiritual world you can go that God isn't. The only place God won't be is where he chooses not to be. That's it. Psalms 19 says that even the heavens declare his glory. I use that all the time in my thoughts and in my lessons. God's glory is declared by his creation. I need to be aware of that. And I think that's why he made it so beautiful and so wonderful. Because so I could see he is really there and he is really caring. And he really does manifest himself to those who will open their eyes and see him. You see him in the pages of the word of God. But can you not see him in what he created? Romans chapter 1 says you better because you're without excuse. I read the description of the Garden of Eden. I think, man, wouldn't that be a good place to be in? Yeah. I want you to know I don't want that place. <laughs> you can have it if you want it. I don't want it. I want to be around the throne of God in heaven. I don't want a garden. I want the home of God itself. And I know that's a picture of it. It's a physical picture of it. But I don't want the picture. I want the real thing. Well, God touches everything. And anything he touches is good. I won't say it's better. Okay? Our world is broken. <coughs> you can take what you want to and say this world is a good place. But you take God out of it, and it becomes very evil very quick. I'm going to show you that in a second. But every time God's there, and everything he touches, it's always better. He makes things fitting for his purpose. And you can go to the book of Colossians, and Paul says there, you are made suitable for heaven. None of us are suitable without Jesus. But any of us become suitable when his blood is applied to our soul. At Springville this morning, I talked about the promise that was made to Abraham and how it was sealed with a sign of circumcision and how that God says that he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Did Abraham make mistakes? Oh, there's all kinds of mistakes. Right after the blessing was given to him in chapter Genesis 12, he lies about his wife. Say you're my sister. Well, she was a half, I guess, of some sort. But it wasn't true. And Pharaoh calls his hand on it and says, that's not right. But when you get to Romans chapter 4, Paul says about the blessing and it was counted to him for righteousness because he believed God. When things are touched by him, they become pure. And I give you the illustration of a stream that's polluted. It cleans itself. <coughs> and one thing I have in memory for that, you know that's true, but the one thing I have in memory is when I was in about the third, maybe fourth grade, playing down here at Springville School, and I go home and I tell my mama, and my mama and daddy were teachers down there, and I go home and tell my mama that we didn't have to come in and drink that old awful water in the school, that old sulfur water that stunk. We didn't have to do that. Because Crystal Creek's down there. And Crystal Creek is a pure creek. And the water tastes so good. 
And my mama, being a teacher, knows there is no stream behind Springville School. <laughs> Just let that soak for a minute. <laughs> so she says, come on, son, show me the stream. So I take her down there and show it to her. She says, man, that's a nice stream. I did not know it was here. Let's follow it and see where it goes. It was coming out of the septic tank of the school. We'd been drinking that water for over a month. Not a single one of us got sick. And it tasted really good. What does that tell you? That God purifies that which is polluted. Okay? Can you make an application? I am polluted. When God touches me, he purifies. And so 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 says, If any man has this hope, the hope of being like Christ is, when he comes again, he purifies himself, even as he is pure. Do not lop off the last part of that. Because you purify yourself in the things that you do because God has already made you pure. Why would I do that? Number one, because God says to. But number two, because of the example that I set. God put his spirit in us to produce the fruit that he wants produced. There's all those love, joy, peace, and all those things we call the fruit of the Spirit. Those things are outcomes of what God has done to us. He's purified us, and when we purify ourselves, the change in us becomes like God. So we begin to look like him. And those characteristics are how God has expressed himself to us. So then and now. Back then, Jesus was born. Wise men came to worship him, and they went to Herod. Where is he? And they said, in Bethlehem. It scared Herod to death. The Bible does not say it scared Herod. But what it says was that Herod had the babies killed, two years old and younger, the males, because he was scared of him. He was a king. And the religious leaders quickly turned against Jesus when he began his ministry. They began to plot, what can we do with him? How can we stop him? How can we keep him from taking over everything? And Satan entered in. He splits the disciples up. There's Judas he enters into, gets him to go and betray Jesus. The disciples are arguing, who's the greatest? Surely, this movement doesn't have any chance of winning. Well, we have the same thought in this nation. We're one nation under God. I mean, our documents from long ago say so. Ronald Reagan said, if we ever forget we are one nation under God, we will be a nation gone under. August 23rd, 1984. In August of 2008, Barack Obama says, we are no longer a Christian nation. Look at the change in those two. Now, I want to cut Barack Obama some, some slack here, okay? That is what he said. But it's not exactly what was in his speech. He left one word out, and it changed the whole meaning. What was in his speech was, we are no longer just a Christian nation. And we only added, we are also a Muslim nation. We are also a Hindu nation. We are, and he gave several different parameters. But there is a huge change in how that was affected. And there's a huge change in the minds of people. And the question for me today is, am I under God? 
Because you see, this has nothing to do with our nation. This has to do with me. It is an individual religion. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the waters of life freely. For only then will we allow God to touch us as he wants to touch us and change us into being what he envisions for us to be. But Jesus has come. This Christmas season, it brings to mind that he's come and he's wanting to touch each of us to give us the faith that saves us. He's waiting to touch everyone. And I need to remind myself that and to renew that every Christmas season, every Sunday, and every day. So I close this lesson with let God touch you. Worship gives you the opportunity to profess your faith and love. And there's two kinds of worship. First is your private worship. How do you honor God in your private life? When you are alone, when nobody's around you, when nobody sees you, nobody hears you, how do you honor God? And the other way is our what I call corporate worship or our congregational worship where we come and we sing and we pray and we pay attention to all these things going on in this service. That strengthens one another. It encourages one another. It helps one another. And so our worship is first upward to God. My private worship, my public worship is to you, God. It's not to you. But the example I set here in this service is one which honors God or it doesn't. And it's one which strengthens you or it weakens you. And Lord, help me keep my mind on what I'm here to do. God, touch me. Touch me. Secondly, recognizing God's touch every day and what he is doing. And some say God don't do it, doesn't do anything in my life. Yes, he does. You're still breathing. Your heart's still beating. And you're still here. And that means God's doing something. He holds all things together. And he's holding you together. Just take that spirit out of you and watch what happens to you. You know what happens when an armadillo walks across the road? There's a car waiting for him. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. <laughs> and he lays there with his feet up and he starts to rot. And that's what happens to you. God is holding you together. With his spirit in you. And every day Lord. I need to realize that. And when I bow my head. And give thanks for my food. I know that it's a gift from him. And when I'm healing. And getting well. From all this sinus congestion. Lord thank you. Thank you. He is doing all kinds of stuff. In our life. Let him touch you and recognize that. And affirm your devotion to God in your life. When I became a Christian, it was an affirmation. God, I believe. I accept Jesus. I accept the forgiveness. I accept your choosing me. I accept your promise of heaven. I accept a lot of things in you, but it is my devotion to you. When I get up in the morning and I say, thank you, God, for waking me up. Thank you for blessing me with rest. Thank you. Be with me this day. Guide me and keep me. And every day, renew that devotion. And I come here in this service and I honor him and give him praise. Renew my devotion to you. Make me more spiritual. Make me more dedicated to you. Make my service to you more faithful. Thank you, God, for being you.
And finally, be aware of the example we set. There's somebody out there that's looking at you and saying, there's a Christian. Look what they're doing. It's either positive or negative. But they're out there looking at you. And you either bring reproach or you bring honor upon God by them. It's in the kingdom. And what they see, what they get from God through you. So Lord, be with me in this life. Touch me and let me see that touch. Amen.